Thank you very much. I think we're ready. It's really great to see so many people joining us. So yeah, I'd like to start the Access to Space for All Initiative expert meeting. Um, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's really a pleasure to have you in this event. So before we begin, I'd like to make some announcements. So first of all, please use the chat box to ask any questions and please do not raise your hand. Um, we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the very end of uh, today's session, but of course we will have Q&A for uh, Q&A time for uh, after each presentation. So if you have any questions related to what's being presented, please make sure to write it in the chat box and we will try to collect them and answer them as much as possible. Second, um, please answer our questionnaire that we will be putting in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat. He will be sharing you with useful links and also a link to our questionnaire. We would really appreciate your feedback on this event and to access to Space for All. So please answer our questionnaire before you leave. This questionnaire will be the same for the three days. So you can answer them. Um, you can answer the questionnaire at the very end of the three days. Or um, if you're, let's say, only joining today, please answer it today. So yeah, we leave that up to you. But we will definitely share the links. And third, last but not least, um, please use the hashtag access to space for all and follow, like, and share um, you and USA to help us promote this event and access to space for all. We are active on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So our Access to Space for All Initiative Expert Meeting looks like this. So it is a three day event. Today we will start off with the opening remarks and then we will have an overview of the initiative and then dive into the separate sessions. So session one, we will be talking about the hypergravity and microgravity track where our partners and awardees will give you presentations. Day two will be um, more focused on the satellite development track and space exploration track. And day three is more of discussion. So we will be talking about effective outreach. And session five, lessons learned and way forward is only for partners, awardees and past applicants, but that is where we will be really going deep into the lessons learned and how we can do, how we can work on to uh, really uh, expand and improve the initiative. So um, just to give you the objectives of our expert meeting, what we want to do is first of all, share and gain insights from success stories and challenges on capacity building activities and effective outreach. We believe our partners and awardees have a lot to share that could be very useful to anyone who is, um, let's say, um, interested in applying to an access to space for opportunity. So we really want to share a lot of information here. The second is to discuss how to improve the access to space for all initiative. Our initiative is a growing process. We are really interested to hear feedback on how we can really improve it and expand it. So that is a big topic for us. The third is to really bring together partners, awardees, supporting governments, and potential future partners and applicants of the initiative to really create a network and build new partnerships. Of course, it's an online event, but by understanding who's doing what and really getting to know each other on the different activities, I think it will help in future networks and partnerships. So we hope that, um, yeah, it will bring together a lot of different people. And last but not least, we really want to raise awareness of our initiative. We are doing a lot on social media and uh, presenting at conferences and all, but we really want to raise more awareness so that more people um, can join in the initiative and we really want to help more people. So in that sense, yeah, raising awareness is one of the very important objectives as well. So um, this is what our agenda looks like. You can find the detailed agenda on our website as well. Um, so yeah, with this, I'd like to move on to the opening remark part of our session. So first of all, we will start with um, the acting director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, um, our boss, Mr. Nicholas Hedman. Uh, we, have record, we have a recorded video of him, so I will um, give the floor to my colleague who has the video. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues, I'm pleased to see so many of you joining us for the first Access to Space for All expert meeting. Welcome to this three-day virtual gathering. The Office for Outer Space Affairs Access to Space for All initiative, launched in 2018, is one of our flagship activities. Naming the initiative Access to Space for All might seem to many as a cliché, but at UNUSA, we truly believe in universal access to space infrastructure and benefits. Space is a powerful sector 
one that transforms industries, economies, and societies. Through access to space for all, we are ensuring these advantages reach everyone. Thanks to cooperation among established space actors, the United Nations, and new or emerging space entities, the initiative enables communities globally to use and benefit from space technologies and applications. We are predominantly supporting developing countries that often lack resources, both human and financial, to carry out space-related efforts. Some of the programs are exclusively open to these nations. So far, the impact has been larger than we anticipated. Participation in the initiative has led to more partnerships opportunities, visibility through media coverage, and the development of new infrastructure and departments at universities. It is boosting the interest in space activities in all countries that it has touched upon. Access to space for all is not only providing capacity building opportunities, but it is also becoming a tool to engage more people in STEM. UNUSA and AWDs are actively pursuing outreach activities to various communities, including schools and researchers in different science fields. Thanks to these endeavors, the initiative inspires young people about STEM education and space projects. In short, our mission is not only to bring space to them, but also to bring them to space. The initiative has a strategic structure, but altogether it offers a holistic experience for teams with different skill sets. The applicants can start with opportunities that are technically easier to carry out, then move on to more complex experiments on the ground and eventually in space. Currently, the Frontier Center around partnerships utilizing the International Space Station as well as China Space Station and launching CubeSats into orbit. This approach has proven very effective as we have seen teams and countries progressively applying for different opportunities. Across our partnerships, gender empowerment is among the key priorities and one we keep on improving. Today, the representation of women is one of the selection criteria for our hands-on opportunities. Teams that apply are encouraged to be gender balanced, matching the spirit of access to space for all. Sustainable development goals are central to the efforts of the Access to Space for All initiative. Quality education, decent work and economic growth and industry innovation and infrastructure are among the most targeted ones. But across different awardees, all 17 SDGs have been addressed. We take pride in making the results spill over beyond individual campaigns and creating a long lasting impact. None of this would be possible without the contributions of our great partners. I express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your invaluable support and long standing cooperation. The access to unique infrastructure, information, and knowledge that you provide unlocks a treasure chest of opportunities for countries and individuals around the world. In this regard, allow me to say that UNUSA welcomes offers to establish new partnerships. Building and strengthening strategic alliances will continue to deliver space benefits to everyone. Let me welcome you all once again to this expert meeting. In the next three days, we are reflecting on the achievements and progress since 2018 and identify ways to support to the United Nations member states. We are sharing success stories and challenges in space-related capacity building activities and effective outreach and listening to first-hand experience of the partners and awardees of the initiative. I hope all participants learn more about the different opportunities and their possibilities. And I also look forward to your ideas and recommendations to take the initiative even further. Help us help you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, our acting director, Mr. Hedman, for the opening remarks. And now I'd like to give the floor to the permanent representative of Japan. So to Mr. Imanishi Nobuharu, who is the minister um, at the permanent uh, representative, uh, permanent mission of Japan.
I give you the floor, Mr. Manishi. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of my ambassador, Shikihara, who unfortunately is not able to join you due to his sudden unavailability. I am honored to deliver the opening remarks on this special occasion of the expert meeting of the Access to Space for All initiative. Let me begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to the UN USA for organizing this event and for its tireless efforts to implement the initiative. It is fair to say that we are benefiting more than ever from space systems and space derived data. The fact that the number of couples member states has reached 102 demonstrates the importance of peaceful use of outer space. Japan recognized that developing countries have a great need to access the benefits that space technology will bring to our lives. In this regard, UN USA's Access to Space All initiative launched in 2018 is a very useful program to support developing countries' efforts to acquire space technology. I'd also like to highlight the Space 2030 agenda adopted at the 76th UN General Assembly in 2021, recognize the importance of this initiative as a useful tool for capacity building in the 21st century with the aim of broadening access to space in support of the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Now, as many as 11 partners are providing various opportunities through a number of hands-on and education components. I'm pleased to note that these include two programs that Japan has been supporting for years, namely the Kibo Q program and the postgraduate study on Nanosatellite Technology Fellowship, BNST. We are proud that Japan has been able to lead the international cooperation in this field. Let me briefly explain these programs. The Kibo Cube offers educational and research institutions from developing countries the opportunity to deploy CubeSats from the Japanese experiment module Kibo of the International Space Station. In addition, a handful of online lectures on satellite development are also available. By developing and actually op operating their own CubeSat, we expect that the participating countries will be able to acquire the necessary knowledge for satellite development. We also hope that this experience will eventually contribute to the establishment of national space programs and national legal frameworks in each country. Second, as for the PNST Pro Fellowship, QTEC accepts up to six graduate students each year. It provides the students with the hands-on training needed to become competent space engineers. To date, more than 60 international students have enrolled in the course, and we are proud that the graduates are playing an active role in leading the country's space program. I firmly believe that the triangular cooperation of the initiative in which the UN USA connects non-spacefaring countries and emerging spacefaring countries with providing capacity building opportunities. I'm also sure that the relationship established between the countries through this initiative has the potential to develop into further cooperation in the future. Today's expert meeting aims to collect and share widely the achievements of the initiative, success I look forward to hearing the voices of the countries involved. Finally, I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing my sincere hope that this event will be successful and contribute to the further development of the initiative. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Manishi, for the remarks. We really appreciate all the support we received from our space sparing partners and countries. So thank you so much for all your support and access to Space for All. Next, I'd like to invite to the floor Her Excellency, Ms. Mary Wangui Mugwanja, the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Kenya. Ambassador, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ken uh, government of Kenya, I'd like to thank the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNOSA, and other partners for organizing this first Access to Space for All expert meeting, which gives us a unique opportunity not only to share our respective space journeys, but also to inspire each other as we seek to benefit from space science and technology for our socioeconomic development. I note with gratitude that since uh, 2018, UNOSA's Access to Space for All initiative has continued to promote and support access to space technology and its associated benefits to all countries and particularly to developing countries. Kenya has significantly benefited from this initiative, which has been instrumental in nurturing the growth of our space sector. Indeed, the Kenya Space Agency has immensely benefited from this noble initiative. Allow me to highlight some of the key, uh, key milestones that Kenya uh, has achieved, which are directly linked to the Access for Space for All initiative. In 2018, UNOSA and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, announced the first round of KiboCube initiative to promote use of Japanese experiment module, Kibo, on the International Space Station in order to build capacity of emerging countries in small satellite development. Kenya emerged among the winners of this first edition of the initiative. In 2018, with the support of Zapienza University of Rome, the first Kenya University nanosatellite precursor flight, that is one Kunz PF, was launched from the ISS, becoming Kenya's first satellite in space. The nanosatellite offered valuable hands-on experience and requisite capacity to both students and the University of Nairobi on the design, development, an operation of small satellites on a limited budget. In 2021, Kenya was selected alongside Egypt and Uganda as the Air Base Defense Bartromeo Awardees. The Egypt Kenya Uganda Climate Camera, that is EKU ClimCam, projects provide these countries with an opportunity to host a multi spectral camera on the Bartromeo module on the ISS and assist in decision making for climate change monitoring and mitigation. Additionally, in 2021, UNOSA and the Kildish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian uh, Academy of Science, that is Kiam Ras, opened the first round of international optical network isonscope opportunity. Through isonscope, Kiam RAS provides small telescopes to research institutions and agencies in developing countries to enhance capacities in space, science, and astronomy. The telescopes are to be used to observe and track near Earth objects or NEOs and potentially hazardous, hazardous asteroids, PHAs, for analysis and use in early warning systems for potential asteroid impacts. The Kenya Space Agency was among the first round of beneficiaries of this award. In February this year, Kenya became the first awardee of the 3U CubeSat project on the development of a 3U nano satellite for zero graffiti peace, diplomatic, peace diplomacy messaging mission. The satellite will be developed by the University of Nairobi in partnership with the University of Arizona and the Space Trust from the United Kingdom. The award was offered at the, under the auspices of NOSA and the AVIO Collaborative Accessing Space with Vega C program, and will offer a launch opportunity to one new or aggregates using a VO Vega C rocket. Moreover, in April this year, UNOSA will, with the support from the French government conducted a technical advisory mission in Nairobi in partnership with the Kenya Space Agency under the auspices of the Space Law for New Space Actors project 
to support Kenya in developing policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks that draw from international best practices and in tandem with the norms and practices of international law. In conclusion, allow me to sincerely thank you, NOSA, for this initiative that is quite impactful and for being a valuable partner in Kenya's spacefaring journey. The initiative has provided a strong foundation to create opportunities and grow our space sector value chain from satellite engineering to space science. The initiative has equally opened doors to opportunities for Kenya for international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space. In this regard, I also wish to thank all our partners in the Kenya space journey, and we look forward to deepening these collaborations further for our common good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for the very kind words. We are very, re we really think that Kenya is an amazing uh, country that is really using our initiative and our different capacity building programs to really strategically develop space and space capacity. So we really hope that many countries join and, and take this example of Kenya and really um, engage with us through access to space for all. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for the very good comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next I'd like to move on to an overview of the Access to Space for All initiative. So, um, the goal of the Access to Space for All initiative is really to provide research and orbital opportunities for all UN member states and to make sure that um, we provide access to space and that the benefits of space are really accessible to everyone. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, at UNUSA we have a lot of different capacity building activities, but Access to Space for All is focused on space technology. And through joining Access to Space for All, we've seen a lot of benefits, which you can see on the left-hand side of this, uh, the presentation. So through joining Access to Space for All, uh, we're providing an opportunity where applicants can acquire cutting-edge skills for jobs and other opportunities and develop hands-on capabilities from A to Z. What I mean by A to Z is starting off with easier, smaller uh, skills and moving on to more complicated and uh, more complicated skills and opportunities. So we're providing a gradual learning path starting from small and moving on to bigger missions. Second of all, we provide all of this free of charge. So we provide access to unique ground and space infrastructure, technology, and information. Our partners will explain about the amazing opportunities that they are providing, but we are providing this access free of charge. The third point is that through provide um, through the initiative, sorry, um, the applicants will gain the awardees will gain international cooperation um, experience by working with us, the United Nations, and with our space bearing partners. And international cooperation is a key element that is very important for future space missions, and we are providing this opportunity. Fourth is um, through the opportunities, we are providing visibility to the research and development done um, in each country and of course the different space activities. So as we said, we are doing a lot of outreach and promotion, but through um, joining us in the initiative, we are trying to maximize that outreach and really provide more visibility to what you're doing already in your country. And last but not least, through the initiative, we are really trying to motivate the young generation and boost interest in STEM and of course, especially space. In the middle, you can see access to space for all in numbers. So currently we have nine hands-on opportunities, one annual fellowship. We have three, uh, 32 awardees involving 44 entities from 32 countries. We have five CubeSats launched already uh, with three more coming. And we've done seven microgravity experiments and we have more microgravity and hypergravity experiments uh, being uh, developed right now. We have 20 projects in development and we have 68 scholarships that we have granted. And of course, we've done a lot of educational content through webinars, of course, during the pandemic as well. And we have more than 80 hours of content on YouTube. So as an initiative, we especially foster SDG4, quality education, number eight, decent work and economic growth, and number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. The technology and infrastructure that the participating teams achieve and build, the applications coming from the projects that they develop and the partnerships that they form all contribute to the different 17 SDGs. 
So um, you can see the uh, numbers a bit more in detail. So as of April 2023, we have, as I mentioned earlier, awarded 32 opportunities to 44 entities from 32 countries. And um, you can see that the principal investigators, so the teams are almost evenly distributed around, along the different uh, regions. And for our videos, um, as of April 2023, our YouTube channel was viewed a, a lot of times, and especially uh, for the access to space for all webinars that we have been doing. And Kibokuva Academy is one of the most popular series, but we've done so many different series on hypergravity and microgravity, general information about the initiative like this. And of course, when we open new uh, rounds of opportunities, we have webinars dedicated to that. So here you can see some of the impacts of the Access to Space for All initiative. Of course, our awardees will be able to explain more in detail to you, but participation in our initiative has really led to more partnerships, opportunities, media coverage, and development of departments and universities, and also infrastructure. It not only raises the interest in space, but can lead to more investment in STI. Just to give you an example, on the left-hand corner, you see Aerospace AI and Digital Center. This is a new infrastructure, a new building that was built after uh, we selected a team from Tunisia, a university in Tunisia, to do their experiments through KiboCube, so the one-year deployment opportunity. So by being selected for KiboCube, the university was able to build a new infrastructure. Another example is the one on the right hand corner um, one of the teams that participated in drop test, which is a microgravity experiments. Um, they acquired um, skills and the experience to actually utilize it into providing um, different machines. So this is a ventilator that was um, used during COVID-19. So the project itself was on a different theme, but the experience, the skills, the knowledge, the know-how they gained through drop test actually converted into different technology and into different and into a different project that really had a big impact to the country in Bolivia. To learn more about the impacts, we have the awardee page. Um, so we have a page dedicated to each of the awardees where you can find the news, um, activities, um, publications. So any information related to the activities of the awardees, you can find there. And of course, we've been doing a bunch of interview articles as well. Um, we have been doing one focusing on the contribution to the SDGs. So how access to spacefall is really connected, linked, and really contributing to the SDGs. So please have a look at our interview articles if you're interested. Um, especially we've done uh, articles on Bartolomeo, um, PNST, drop test, and FI, and of course we will have more coming in the future. So if you want to learn more about the activities of the awardees and of course about the partners, please have a look at our interview articles as well. So um, this is the structure of our initiative. It is working progress and we are trying to expand our support. So we have three main components that form the initiative. The hands-on component is the actual hands-on research and experiment opportunities. The tool component is a list of tools such as software, open platforms and systems um, that can really help you help the teams uh, participate in the hands-on opportunities. And the education component is where we provide the theoretical foundation to participate in the hands-on component, but also to use the tools in the tools component. And the components are structured to serve the three different tracks you see there with the different goals. So first of all, just to give you an overview of the hands-on components, um, we have nine active uh, opportunities right now. And I'm pleased to say that we will be opening a few of these um, in the end of this month, so in May, and also in the beginning of June, um, we will be opening a few of these opportunities open for application so that you can apply and be selected. So please keep your eyes open and yeah, uh, make sure to check out our website and all. But we have a lot of active things going on for the hands on component. So um, first of all, I'd like to give an overview of the hypergravity and microgravity track, and the aim is to build capacity for conducting experiments in orbit. But first of all, why are we doing hypergravity and microgravity? What can we gain from there? Well, we think that hypergravity and microgravity experimentation, doing research and development in that special environment, 
is really an achievable entry point to acquire knowledge and skills. And especially through this hypergravity and microgravity environment, you can test so many different scientific fields, ranging from biology, material science. You can also um, demonstrate technology. You can test things there. So it's a real achievable entry point to really get the skills that you need. And second, we think it's a beneficial first step to start capacity building for space activities. The uh, opportunities that we offer are uh, we both have on ground facilities and on orbit um, facilities. But when you start on ground, it's the real first step to start doing hypergravity and microgravity experimentation and really moving on to um, skills in space activities. So for the hands-on opportunities, we have five. We have drop tests, hyper tests, which are our on-ground opportunities. And on the left-hand side, you see Bartolomeo, Chinese and the China Space Station, and Dream Chaser. So these are our on-orbit opportunities. The details will be explained by our partners, but as you can see, we have this gradual learning path starting from the ground and moving up um, to orbit. Right now in the middle, we have the suborbital and parabolic flights, which is uh, we don't have an opportunity there, but we identify it as a gap, so we're looking for partners that can help us fill this. For the education component, we have been doing a lot of webinars for this. Um, I believe my colleague Wenbin will share it in the chat, but we have many webinars dedicated to each of the opportunities, but also to the track itself, where we covered all the different scientific fields that you can um, experiment in hypergravity and microgravity. We also opened a new opportunity with Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, um, called Kibo RPC, which is the Robot Programming Challenge. And um, this is currently closed, but it was an opportunity to help uh, uh, students acquire software skills and uh, software engineering skills and programming skills. The next track is the satellite development track, where the aim is to build capacity that enables the development, deployment, and the operation of satellites, and of course the utilization of what comes out of the satellites as well. Um, we believe that CubeSats offer a large variety of applications that can help many different nations with the different topics that they're interested in. And CubeSat de development is really the first step for a country and the acquisition of skills and know-how needed to develop a space program, so in a larger scale. And CubeSats are becoming very affordable to develop and represent an achievable entry point to start space activities. So we believe it's the next step after the hypergravity and microgravity track. In the hands-on opportunities, you can see that we have three opportunities. One is uh, FI, uh, the payload hosting initiative with MBRSC. Um, another one is KiboCube, the 1U deployment opportunity with JAXA. And VEGA-C is the 3U deployment opportunity with Avio. These will be explained tomorrow um, in tomorrow's session. But these are the hands-on opportunities we have currently. We have an identified gap for CANSATs. We don't have a program. We're interested if any partner has uh, uh, yeah, any opportunities for CANSATs, but we believe that's uh, something we would like to fill for the gradual learning path. For the education component for this track, we work with uh, the Kyushu Institute of Technology, um, QTech, to provide uh, scholarships to go and study in Japan to learn the whole life cycle of satellite development called PNSD, and this will be uh, presented tomorrow as well. And last but not least, our third track is the space exploration track, which is really broadening the engagement in space exploration. We believe that for space exploration, it's Increasing capability in astronomy and observation of space data analysis can really deepen scientific knowledge and support the necessary technology for monitoring space debris, managing space traffic, and future exploration beyond geo, which is a hot topic these days and which is something that the space industry is going in the direction of. So we believe that it would be helpful to have a space exploration track in the sense of to support these technologies and knowledge. And space exploration is something that really motivates the young generation who are the leaders of tomorrow. So we want to be engaged in that. And last but not least, space exploration is definitely an international effort. And through the initiative, we really want to foster international cooperation. So these are the reasons why we're uh, pursuing the space exploration track. As you can see, we only have one opportunity um, with uh, Kiam Russ, um, with our partners in Russia for Isonscope, which is the provision of telescopes. Um, this will be explained tomorrow as well. But we are looking for more opportunities that can really um, yeah, engage and have more uh, links to space exploration. And of course, uh, we've done webinars with Isonscope and with our partners at Kim, so we do have webinars uh, for that as well, but we are also looking for more content for space exploration as well. So 
um, partnerships are a distinctive feature of our initiative. And as you can see there, we would not be able to provide these opportunities without the governmental, intergovernmental and industry partners that you see there, because they are the ones that really provide access to the unique ground and space infrastructures that are usually too costly or non accessible to developing nations. So they are really the people who are helping us uh, provide these opportunities, and we thank our partners so much. UNUSA is also open to new partnerships. As I mentioned earlier, we have some gaps identified, but basically we are looking for more partnerships, especially the ones that you can see on the right hand side. So on ground, more on ground on orbit experiment opportunity, suborbital parabolic balloon flights, launch opportunities for CubeSats and hosted payloads, um, access to infrastructure and provision of scientific tools. Um, for CAM, we do telescopes, but if there's any other scientific tools that we can provide, that would be great. And of course, fellowships, internships, educational content, and to uh, really support our tools component, we're looking for all open source, cost-free softwares and tools that we can um, share the information on. But I just want to emphasize that partnerships are also beneficial for the leveraging side. So most of our awardees are not working alone. They work with partners, they work, they find uh, universities, they find industry partners that can help them really realize what they want to do in their project. So yeah, there is really no need to develop space capabilities on your own. There are so many um, available opportunities like access to space for all and partnerships take you a step further. So please take advantage of what we have and I hope you will learn from the three days of what we have to offer for you um, through access to space for all and how these partnerships will really benefit you. So with this, I will finish my brief um, explanation about access to space for all. I, I have a detailed presentation on the website which has more explanation of the each project so if you're interested please take a look and of course uh, we have our brochure we uh, put together this brochure last year in the summer so if you're interested in more stats information stories about the awardees and partners please take a look at our brochure as well okay so next we will dive into the next session so the actual interesting part of uh, access to space for which is the actual projects. So um, with this, I'd like to invite to the floor Ms. Merle Cornelius, um, who is our partner czar um, for the drop test opportunity. Um, I will give Merle the floor. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, also welcome from um, my side um, to my presentation about um, ZAM and the Brim drop towers. Um, so in the beginning of my talk, I will shortly introduce you to ZAM and the Bremen Drop Tower, as well as our new facility, the Gravi Tower Bremen Pro. And in the end, I will say a few words about the um, successful drop test program. And um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, ZAM is located in Northwest Germany and was founded in 1985. And here you see the most prominent um, facility, the Bremen Drop Tower. And this is a microgravity lab. Um, yeah, where already over um, 9,000 uh, drops and catapult launches were performed so far, providing microgravity for over 300 projects from all over the world. And that is divided into three parts. The Research Institute belongs to the University of Bremen. The ZAM Drop Tower Operation and um, Service Company provides the facility and the technical support. And ZAM Technic is a spin off, which is a supplier for attitude control and equipment um, for satellites. And next to the Bremen um, Drop Tower, um, we at ZAM provide uh, several more facilities like a hypergravity lab with a 30T centrifuge, um, a thermal vacuum lab, and a vibration test lab with a long stroke shaker. The drop tower has a height of uh, 146 meters, where inside the outer structure is a um, inner tube, which gets fully evacuated within one and a half hours um, by 18 vacuum pumps to a final pressure of 0.1 millibar. And this is done to reduce the air drag inside the inner vacuum tube. And um, by doing this, we achieve a very high microgravity quality um, in the range of 10 to minus 6 G. And since this, this needs to be dropped, the um, number, the maximum number of drops per day is limited to three, yeah, three runs per day. 
Um, the experiments are housed inside of um, drop capsules, and after the drop, the capsules are decelerated inside the 8 meter high deceleration container filled with polystyrene pellets with an impact of up to 50 G. And in the basement of the building is the catapult system located. The drop tower can be used for or with two operation modes. Um, during the drop mode, the um, capsule gets um, lifted to the top of the tower, then released into microgravity and the 110 a free fall distance uh, enable a microgravity time of 4.7 seconds. Um, the second mode is the so-called catapult mode, where the drop capsule gets launched from the bottom of the tower on a parabola trajectory, which enhances the microgravity time to 9.3 seconds. And uh, now I want to show you some impressions from inside the integration hall. Here you see uh, an experiment integrated into the um, drop capsule, um, the capsule structure was just then placed inside um, this cylindrical case and afterwards the capsule is um, transported inside the drop tower. And um, here you see my colleagues from the engineer team preparing the um, drop capsule uh, for the lift off um, to the top of the tower. And um, therefore, um, the capsule um, top or the cover is connected to a um, winch. And um, by the slider you see here, um, the capsule is then transported or to, uh, to the top of the tower. And uh, this is the um, deceleration chamber. And after the um, inner tube gets sealed, the uh, evacuation started. And within the one and a half hours, the scientists have access to their um, experiment from the control room, which can be seen here. And yeah, when the final pressure is reached and the scientists give um, their go for their experiment, um, everything is ready. And the um, yeah, experiment inside the capsule can be dropped. As I mentioned, um, Vietnam also um, provide a um, unique catapult system, which was um, developed by the um, DAM engineer team. And um, the uh, catapult system is based on a combination of a pneumatic and hydraulic drive, which accelerates the drop capsule to a maximum speed of 168 uh, kilometers per hour within uh, 250 milliseconds. And um, right after the capsule is launched into microgravity, um, you see that the deceleration chamber is uh, transported beneath or below the um, inner vacuum tube so that um, um, the capsule lands safely on its way down. Um, yeah. Our new facility at ZAM is called um, Gravitower Bremen Pro, and this is a new um, drop tower approach um, based on a, a guided system where no vacuum is needed. And the tower is built or was built inside the integration hall, so the um, height of the tower is limited to 60 meters. And here the experiments are housed inside of a slider, which is um, accelerated um, by a road, rope drive based on a hydraulic winch. And during the um, acceleration on the vertical parabola, um, vibrations might couple into the um, experiments. And to prevent this, a novel release caging mechanism was developed um, to decouple the experiments from the slider. So the slider acts as an um, air shield. And um, by doing this, we do no longer need any vacuum and uh, can still provide a high microgravity quality in the level of 10 to minus 4G. And um, the big advantage here is that the repetition rate is uh, quite high with up to 960 runs per day. And another um, quite nice feature of the gravity tower is that the flight parabola can be fully customized according to the needs of the scientists. So um, a, a 4G acceleration uh, enables a maximum microgravity time of 2.5 seconds 
while a smoother acceleration of 2G still enables um, um, time and weightlessness of 1.9 seconds. And on the right hand side, you see in red the flight parabola and in blue the um, acceleration. And again, I want to show you some uh, nice images of the Gravi Tower. Um, yeah, as I said, it's um, built inside the um, integration hall directly next to the large tower. And um, the scientists have access to um, in the user interface where they can optimize the initial acceleration or deceleration, as well as um, uh, adding a smoothing function as shown here to um, optimize the transition into microgravity. And the um, quite low uh, initial acceleration in combination with the decoupling of the experiment um, from the slider um, leads to a very smooth uh, transition into microgravity. And um, this can be seen here in these um, demonstration videos. Um, the scientists also have easy access to their um, experiment. So um, in case some um, probes needs to be um, exchanged or um, some adjustments to the, um, to the setup um, yeah, are required, um, the scientists can just open the door since no vacuum is needed and um, do their or work um, directly on the experiment um, when the capsule is still integrated into the uh, gravity tower. And um, yeah, here you see um, a few more impressions from the rope drive. And um, yeah, um, the last thing I want to point out is that um, the uh, capsule structure is fully compatible with the large tower. So um, if required, um, the scientists can do some measurements in the gravity tower in the morning. And um, yeah, um, then we can just take out the uh, uh, capsule structure with the integrated experiment and um, using the large drop tower um, for um, experiments uh, on longer timescales. Um, for the future, it's a uh, plan to add two more operation modes to the gravity tower. Um, the first one is partial gravity, like the gravitational acceleration of um, Moon and Mars. Um, and this gets more and more important in the field of human exploration and um, the necessary technical development. And the second um, operation mode is the so-called G-vectoring, where the gravitational acceleration gets changed during the flight phase. And um, yeah, whoever is interested in um, yeah, doing um, the experiments uh, in one of our drop towers, there are two different uh, capsule sizes, where um, yeah, especially the standard capsule size um, provides the most flexibility since it can be used in the drop mode. Um, for the catapult and also in the gravity tower. And each capsule um, provides a um, capsule control system and a power supply. And of course, the experiments besides the maximum payload, payload mass width and height must also be designed to withstand the um, impact um, of 50 G. But um, I can uh, reassure you, this um, sounds more demanding than it actually is. And uh, yeah, during the um, job campaign weeks, um, the scientists get um, full support by our engineer team. And um, they are also responsible for the mechanical and electrical integration of the experiment into the capsule, as well as the software interface and the experimental control via the standard network connection. And um, yeah, we at ZAM also provide some equipments to the scientists. For example, high-speed camera systems, non-standard power supply if uh, needed, and um, different vacuum pumps. And I uh, highly recommend you um, to have a look inside our payload user's guide, which can be found on our website under drop tower and um, experiment support. And uh, in the end of my presentation, I want to give you a short overview. Um, about the experiments in the drop tower. So as seen in the um, graph, um, most of the drops um, are scientific experiments in various features, research fields, um, but also hardware tests um, are done in the drop tower for um, different space missions. And of course, we have the uh, three um, student programs, Rexus, Bexus, ESA's Petri program, and uh, of course, drop tests. And um, yeah, we are very happy that um, ZAM can contribute 
to the um, job test program already since um, um, 2014. And yeah, um, it's nice that um, already nine um, student teams from around the world were selected so far um, to doing the experiments in the field of science and technology and um, yeah, gain a lot of experience um, with their experiments in microgravity uh, at the drop tower. And um, with this, I want um, to close my talk with a short conclusion. So the Bremen Drop Towers are microgravity labs for research and technology tests, uh, which act as stepping stones into space, where the drop tower provides 9.3 seconds in microgravity with a very high quality and up to three experiments per day, where on the other side, the um, Gravity Tower Bremen um, provides up to 2.5 um, seconds in weightlessness with up to 960 experiments per day, where also partial gravity option is planned for the future. And with this, I um, yeah, want to close my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Monica, for the detailed presentation about drop tests and about SARM. If anyone has any questions, please write it in the chat. But maybe I'd like to ask one question to Merle. So drop tests, mm -hmm. yeah, we're opening the applications at the end of the month. So when people apply, what should they be careful about? What are things that SARM will check in the application form? So do you have any advice to any teams that want to apply to the microgravity experiments? Um, I think most important point is, of course, um, the feasibility. So um, is it um, yeah, um, is it possible to do this kind of experiment in the um, um, in the drop tower? And um, also, is the drop tower the best suited uh, microgravity um, platform for the um, for the experiment? Um, yeah, this is a point um, where we really have uh, a close look on, and also, um, yeah, is the um, um, the proposed experiment um, also, um, yeah, scientifically relevant. This is another point, yeah, and to have a, um, a yeah a first impression um, about uh, what uh, what is um, possible in the drop tower. Um, um, yeah, each uh, student team can have a look inside the. Um, user guide. Thank you very much, Merle. We'll definitely be announcing and opening the documents. So there you will find all the different criteria that we will be selecting. So um, to anyone who's interested, please um, have a very careful look at the documents. But thank you so much, Merle. Thanks. Now I'd like to invite to the floor one of the awardees of Drop Test um, from Colombia, so Ms. Liliana Marcela Bustante Goes, um, who is from the University of uh, Universidad de Antioquia. Um, we just selected this team, so um, this team will be more of explaining about what they plan to do and how they plan to do their outreach. So yeah, if Liliana, uh, I know you're here, so you can share your screen and turn on your camera and start your presentation. Um, as um, as has to be said. I am Liliana Stamante. I am work in the Universidad de Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia. And now I'm going to talk about our experiment uh, uh, called the position of thin droplets on electronic components in absence of gravity. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you our team. Our team is composed by three students. Two of them are students of a uh, mechanical engineering program, uh, Pilar and Oriana. And the other student is Paulina Quintero. She's an uh, undergraduate student of electronic engineering. And I am the leader and the coordinator project of, the, of this experience. Um, uh, now I'm going to talk um, I'm going to show you about the univers the university. Um, the university is located in South America in, in Medellin City. Uh, Medellin City. Uh, it has um, it is uh, our university is a public university and it's founded in eight, 18 three year. And it has um, the main campus in Medellin City. And it has also nine other nine 
campuses and facilities in other regions of the Department of Antioquia. Well, uh, the, the university has, currently it has um, around 18,000 undergraduate students and 3,000 graduate students. And also about the Faculty of Engineering, uh, this faculty has around 9,000 9, 9, undergraduate students and 400 graduate students. And you can see uh, only 35% the students of the faculty are women. I mentioned that because this, this situation was one of one motivation for us to participate in two challenges and two programs. In the last year, we participated in Barcelona Zero G, and this year we participate in drop test and in the drop test program. The other reason to to participate in this kind of programs for us was the 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 soldering in the space. We ask ourselves about the how is the soldering in the space carried out. Uh, the other question for us was, was the how is the what happens to the microstructure of of a metal if the metal is when it solidifies in a, in a space conditions. In the other question for us, what is the how is the how is the Sorry. How is the uh, how is the what happens to the surface tension in the space and what happens? Uh, and the other question was: Is it possible to solder in the space knowing that liquid floats in the absence of gravity? So, uh, for this reason, we propose to bring to Barcelona this project. Uh, the, pro the, the, the prototype mm, that you can see in this picture was the prototype we tested and we tested in Barcelona in the in the previous year. Then mm, for those questions that I mentioned, we two main objectives. One of them is depositing thin droplets in weightless conditions. And the other one is to analyze the effect of microgravity on the microstructure of thin droplets. For that, we built, uh, we adapt a extruder of the 3D printer to work with a thin filament. This prototype is composed by a thin wire, a PCB, a conveyor belt, a main board that is like a brain of the system, a 3D printed structure, a drive gear, a couple of stepper motor, and a nozzle. Where this prototype works as follows. The PCB is over conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is moved by a stepper motor that is here. And then the supply of the team wide is, con is con controlled by the, the reel, and in the real things, the thin wire, the dry gear that is moved by um, the other stepper motor, and the stepper motor feeds, feeds the thin wire to the hidden block of the extruder, and in the inside the, the hidden block, the tin is melted. After uh, the tin, the the drop that is melted is is pushed out to the is pushed to the nozzle and then is dropped out to the onto the PCB. We we actually sorry currently we are we designed this prototype to adapt to the new condition in the drop tower uh, environment. We we consider that for us we consider that this experiment is relevant because we are so interested in promoting women's participation in STEAM areas and especially in aerospace areas in our faculty with the, uh, with the goal to reduce gender bias inside the faculty. 
the other reason for us, uh, the other reason for us, the experiment is, for, is important is because we we are promoting new research topics such as macrogravity in the Faculty of Engineering, especially in our programs, mechanical and inner space programs. And we are studying solar process focus on space conditions. That is a new topic for, for, the, for us and for faculty too. And we are also contributing to the advancement the advent, of managing aerospace research. Uh, the other, additionally, we are we we think the collaboration with the space agencies like uh, or the or uh, or space or space specialized centers like uh, CERN, we can help to the university to promote space science education in the city, encourage its study, and help the country's space sector development. Colombia now now. Are in are in trying to develop the uh, space sector. So we are we we think that our um, investing our research is so important to promote this kind of studies. Thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you very much, Liliana, for the overview of the project that your university is going to undertake with drop tests. Um, maybe just one question to you. So you were uh, selected as an awardee. What kind of tips would you have for teams that are interested in applying to drop tests? So I think you mentioned that how you connected the SDGs has been a very strong point of your team, especially, especially with gender equality and all. But do you have any other tips that you can give to uh, teams that want to apply to drop tests? Yes, uh, maybe is no, there is an many tip, but <laughs> at this moment I I bring in my mind. Uh, do the uh, the videos, the webinars, is so useful useful for us. Uh, read the guide, the man, the user the user guide of the the user guide of the whatever. The whatever initiatives or um, be be uh, and the other tips can be you must be specific about your project. Uh, don't don't suppress any details. You you should describe everything. And the other tip was. Uh, you have time to to try to to write the propose because it's a um, long for us. It's a um, long propose and needs uh, much time to to dedicate to to work in this kind of propose. I don't know what at the moment. I don't have I no idea ideas for that. No, thank you very much. I think it's useful. As you said, we want as much details as the team can provide in the application form. So, yeah, I think that's very uh, that's a useful tip. Thank you so much, Liliana. OK, OK, um, next I'd like to move on to our second program, which is Hypergest. Um, I'd like to invite to the floor Mr. Jack Van Loon of the European Space Agency um, for his uh, introduction to Hypergest. OK, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'll try to say something about the uh, large diameter centrifuge in light of the um, of the UNOSA ESA combined um, RPGS program. My name is Jacques Vallone. I'm affiliated to the Free University Amsterdam um, uh, and responsible as a facility scientist for the uh, large diameter centrifuge at ESA ESTEC in Noordwijk. For those who don't know, ESA is um, is a collaboration of uh, mainly um, um, countries within Europe. We have uh, currently we have 22 member states within ESA. There are some affiliated member states, but uh, since uh, 1975, where we started off with 10 member states, you see this increase in um, in member states over time. And ESA is a distributed um, um, organization 
where you have various facilities within various countries. Headquarters is in, in Paris, France. Uh, we have um, um, ESA ESTEC, where the large amateur center future is in the Netherlands. You have the astronaut center in Germany, but you have other facilities in, in Spain, the UK, Belgium, French Guinea, of course, the launch site, uh, another operation center in Germany. But I'm talking about the um, uh, ESA ESTEC Large Amateur Centrifuge, uh, and ESA ESTEC is located in the Netherlands, as mentioned, in Noordwijk, and Noordwijk is really on the edge of the country with respect to the sea. This very whitish uh, stripe here is the North Sea. Here you see some dunes, and here you have uh, ESA ESTEC, which is the largest facility of ESA, and uh, here you see this very small in the picture small a dome which is uh, the center of gravity there's where the uh, ldc is located so here you see the dome again this is a full um, image of of the lab of the tech mmg um, uh, life and physical sciences instrumentation laboratory the list lab where we have the centrifuge here we have a support room for the gravity lab where we have also kleinestat for microgravity simulation another centrifuge for research the random position machine for microgravity simulation we have an area for life support the isa melissa program in situ research utilization ffc uh, set up uh, recently um, done within the lab then we have the main life sciences lab where we have incubators flow benches and microscope for people to use we have a clean room a very high clean clean room, um, a meeting room, a very limited uh, workbench, small workshop where small adaptations can be made to hardware if needed. We have another larger workshop on premises, but uh, a lot of uh, things we can do ourselves in the small uh, workbench. We have the wet or analysis lab where we have um, uh, um, light, well, other instruments for um, uh, related to um, uh, analytical research the uh, LCMS, for instance, but we also have uh, uh, vacuum chambers and uh, furnaces. And then we have the support lab where we have uh, autoclaves, uh, water supply and, and so on. If you apply for um, hybrid chess experiment, you can make use of this full lab as well as make use of other labs we have within ESTEC and mainly, um, uh, mainly the material science lab is sometimes used for some of these, um, uh, some of these studies. Here's uh, some link to the uh, to the ESA Tech MMG lab if you want to read more about it. Some pictures of these uh, various labs. Uh, the main lab again, uh, flow benches, uh, workbenches, uh, incubators, microscopes at the end, meeting room where we can discuss and present if needed. The wet lab with various um, uh, shakers, um, balances, and, and other instruments. Support lab, uh, minus 80 uh, millicue and, and demi water, autoclaves, uh, fume hood, chemicals, small workshop with some small instruments. Of course, the control room, here you see the LDC. This is the control room where the LDC is commanded from. This screen is normally used by the um, uh, by the scientists where you have your where you can see your uh, experiment inside one of the gondolas or more gondolas and you can monitor and control the experiments from uh, from this position and we have the ldc preparation lab uh, where you can uh, have one of the gondolas uh, located here and start to prepare your experiment in the lab and then we hook up the gondolas later on if you uh, do um, uh, ground-based research as we do with the large amateur centrifuge GLDC. You can compare it to flight uh, in several ways. Well, this is um, a schematic representation of, of gravity over a, a certain spectrum, going from microgravity to 10 or XG, whatever the G is for a certain system. And of course, if you're interested in gravity, I think you should explore the full spectrum. So you go to microgravity, you either make use of, of the drop tower, as just been explained, or you make use of a parabolic flight, or you make use of facilities in, in the ISF, ISS or another orbiting um, uh, orbiting um, uh, satellite, or make use of centrifuges within these orbiting system to generate uh, partial G. But anything above one G, you can make use of centrifuges and make use of the full spectrum. So you see the dynamics of your um, of your sample of the effect of gravity on your sample It'll either be a linear effect or some sort of exponential effect and this is what you can explore in the centrifuges and preferably also do some low g experiments or partial gravity experiments um, um, after that so the last year with the centrifuge um hang on 
Yes, it's coming up. Um, of course, we can do regular hypergravity research, as I just uh, explained to you. Just see what gravity does, what does 2G to my system, what does 10D to my system, 15G, and so on. Um, you can also use this hypergravity uh, to look into launch simulations uh, to understand what happens to, to your sample before you enter into, for instance, orbital spaceflight. Um, we also see quite some experiments that uh, flew on, hyperbol on parabolic flight and they want to explore the hypergravity phase of this parabolic flight for a longer duration of time. So that's also what you can do in the centrifuge. There's another phenomenon called the gravity continuum, which means what I just explained in a previous um, in the previous slide, that you explore what happens to your sample at various G levels. So uh, this above one G, and then you uh, you can extrapolate that data towards a lower G. So this is also making use of centrifuges. You can say something of what might happen if you go, for instance, to Mars or Moon. Yeah, by extrapolating the, the hypergravity data, um, you generate it making use of centrifuges. There's another way you can use centrifuges. Actually, it sounds a bit funny, but you can use centrifuges to simulate microgravity as a paradigm. We call it the reduced um, gravity paradigm. If you look at the upper panel, you see a regular uh, experiment. Uh, you are on Earth at 1G, and then you have a launch, and then you come into uh, the microgravity um, uh, phase of, of that experiment. And in this phase, of course, you have the adaptation of your sample uh, you know, to this microgravity environment. If you take that same experiment and uh, you um, leave it at 3G to reach a steady state, and from this 3G, you lower your G level to either 2G or 1G. You also have this reduced uh, gravity load, as you see here uh, from 1G to microgravity, you, you see this reduced gravity load from a higher G to a lower G. And the paradigm here is that the changes you see here are similar, not the same, but similar as the, um, as the effect you would see going into real microgravity conditions. So also on ground, making use of centrifuges, you might predict what might happen if you go uh, into real uh, microgravity conditions. So main properties of the LDC, it's an eight meter diameter system. It has four arms. Um, you can have various uh, G levels. I'll show you that in another uh, slide as well, where you can hook up the gondolas at various positions on the arm. So generating uh, different G levels we have seven gondolas, well, six rotating gondola and one um, gondola in the center. And this center gondola is really to uh, have a control for the rotation. Centrifuges are nice. The bad thing or the artifacts in centrifuges is that they rotate. So some systems are sensitive for that, especially, for instance, uh, animal systems where a vestibular system plays part. Um, there, there might be an impact of the uh, rotation onto your, um, you know, onto your sample. So that's why you have, or that's why you can have uh, a central rotating uh, control where you do have the rotation, but not the G levels as you have the outside of the uh, of the gondolas. It's a swing out system, which means that the G levels always perpendicular to the floor of the gondola. Each gondola can hold uh, 80 kilograms of payload um, uh, going up to 20 G. And the motor generates about 22 kilowatts of um, uh, of power. For the hybrid hybrid jet program, uh, you have the possibility to use the LDC for a maximum of two weeks. Within each gondola, uh, we have temperature sensors, we have uh, video capability, analog, digital, and PoE video channels. We have serial connections for RS-232 to either monitor or guide your experiment. We have internet, uh, ethernet channels um, uh, to your experiment, USB 2 and 3 channels. Of course, power supply to 20, 230 volts, assess amps. We have fixation points to mount your experiment either on, on, on the side or on the floor, although most experiments do not need to be mounted. We have uh, uh, connections in the arm to make these um, uh, connections possible within the gondola. And of course, we have outside video channels. Then we have the possibility to uh, provide gases or liquids to your experiments. Um, you know that there could be any kinds of, of gases or liquid um, 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 you need. 
I'm not going to explain this uh, this scheme to you, but this is how the LDC is uh, is configured. This is the rotating part of the LDC with various computers and connections on there. This is a static part of the LDC system, uh, again with a series of connections and computers. Um, you can go to the user manual here um, and you can find um, uh, more details on that and you have some, some time to study this, um, this scheme in more detail. If you want to make use of the uh, of the LDC from your own system, um, one thing we can use is to remote PC setup um, uh, for non uh, also for non Windows systems. But make sure that you have all administrator rights if you apply or if you want to do an experiment making use of your own um, of your own um, uh, computer system. And be sure that you experiment uh, have a dedicated um, uh, dedicated address to uh, to adapt and to address within the system. These are some examples of the uh, LDC startup and uh, stopping uh, time. Um, this is the fastest ramp up. We can go from 1G to 20G in about 60 seconds, and then you have your steady G uh, level, and then the. Um, uh, the uh, slow down or stop time is about the same. It's about it's a bit shorter, 55 seconds to go from 20G to 1G. But you can program any G level you want, uh, taking into account the um, you know the, the the ramp up and the, the ramp down uh, time for this uh, for this uh, system. Here is an example of a Soyuz launch, which uh, depending on the various stages you have for the launch, you can simulate a Soyuz launch, so you can prepare for an experiment, um, especially for man-rated. Um, uh, launches it's the LDC is not capable of simulating the launch of a, of a sounding rocket for instance it can simulate let's say 11g or whatever as a constant value but not the ramp up time that is too fast here also an example uh, that can make use of hypergravity of the LDC with respect to in situ research utilization studies or planetary related studies. This is um, an experiment impact, an education experiment we did some time ago where you see here projectile, um, uh, um, uh, let's say shot at high G's at a sort of regolith um, a simulant here, which you know simulates what might happen if you have small particles or larger particles impacting a planetary surface. And then you can do this at, at different G levels. Uh, this is another experiment uh, where there was an ultrasonic drill. Um, and this group from the University of Glasgow, they wanted to know the performance of the drill at, uh, for instance, um, you know, Mars or another uh, celestial body. Uh, so to see the gravity dependence of that grill and the energy pr um, consumption and so on of that particular system. Uh, so they made a model, um, you know, how this drill would perform under different G levels. So here you see in, in dotted lines, you see the, you know, the model they made. And these are the actual tests they did in the centrifuge. And you see the quite some discrepancy between these two values. So they really have to redo their model to understand, you know, how um, that drill would perform uh, under different G levels and especially under lower G levels. So this experiment could be used to extrapolate the data they found here at higher Gs to extrapolate the data to lower Gs. Of course, with respect to geological studies or um, also with respect to um, building studies or the studies regarding um, uh, larger structures, the uh, LDC or centrifuges can be used uh, for the scaling effect you have with gravity uh, with respect to length, which is related to 1 to n, uh, or time, uh, 1 divided by n squared, or mass divided by n cubed. So you can make use of the centrifuge if you want to look into these phenomena. Here are some examples of experiment configurations. Here you see the um, the impact study I just um, I mentioned. Here we see a crap uh, where we looked into the vestibular system uh, operation at different G levels. Mars and heat transfer experiments where you have the this the experiment actually set up here in one of the gondolas, but we had a, a an elaborate cooling system where you have cooling fluid here in these um, and these containers where the experiment was cooled for uh, about half an hour uh, during the experiment um, because it produced a lot of heat. Planetary and glacier models. This is some some model, you know, model material to simulate glaciers at different G levels um, and at different angles of um, of inclination. So where we can simulate what uh, glaciers would look like on other, uh, you know, on other celestial bodies uh, with different G levels. 
uh, bubble generation experiment. This experiment, we used a lot of cameras to look into uh, a bubble generation of that particular experiment. Here is also a bubble. This is from the University of Barcelona, uh, where this bubble generated here, this nozzle, and going onto the water surface here. This is another experiment where we looked into uh, various phenomena in zebrafish, um, genetic phenomena, and, uh, morphology, and, and um, uh, bone and cartilage, uh, where we do that did that in either hypergravity in the centrifuge or in simulated microgravity in the um, in the RPM Kleinestat mode. We can also have microscopes in the centrifuge. This is the EVOS M7000 microscope. It's a fluorescent, epifluorescent microscope you can use. And this is a light sheet microscope also dedicated to uh, de build dedicate, dedicate built specifically for the LDC, thank you, um, where it's possible to look into more uh, 3D systems um, because of a light sheet um, uh, phenomenon. Finally, uh, you see the um, uh, a list of, of all the, um, let's say, papers, peer-reviewed papers that have been published making use of the LDC in the various uh, uh, disciplines, geology, planetary um, uh, sciences in green, technology in red, material sciences, uh, biology, plant biology, animal physiology, and so on. Here you have direct links to all these papers. If you're interested, you can you can go there. So if there is any questions or remark regarding the LDC, uh, don't wait asking, also in preparation of your proposal. Um, this is my email address, and if you have any more, um, if you need any more information with respect to the uh, to the lab facilities or to the user manual of the LDC, you can go uh, over these uh, URLs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack, for the overview of the LDC and giving a lot of examples on what you can do in hypergravity. So um, I see one question, um, I, I'd just like to address it. So uh, it was about the legibility criteria. Um, of course, the documents will come out at the end of the month. We're, we're opening HyperGest at the end of the month, so you can uh, see the details there. But uh, I would just like to say that uh, the teams uh, should should be from government organizations, research institutes, universities, and other public and nonprofit organizations. And if you're an individual, you, you will not be able to apply. You would have to uh, be part of one of these organizations. But yeah, for details, please take a look at um, our announcement of opportunity document that we will be opening at the end of the month. So um, just one more question to you, Jack, because we're opening HyperGest, what is the best advice you can give to an applicant that's interested in HyperGest. What would you recommend? What what kind of tips would you give to anyone who is interested in, uh, yeah, conducting experiments through HyperGest? I think the main tip I can give is don't limit yourself. Do what you want to do and don't limit yourself uh, beforehand in what you could do in the centrifuge. I mean, the centrifuge. Um, over the years, I've been running this facility now for, for 15 years, uh, we had only one experiment that we could not do in the centrifuge. All the other experiments are somehow able to, to, you know, to be performed within the centrifuge. If you have an idea, you know, don't think it's not possible or it might not be feasible or it might not fit or whatever. I think there's nearly always a solution to, uh, you know, to the scientific or technological question you have. So don't limit yourself. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's really motivational. So anyone who has an idea, throw it in um, through the application form. Of course, uh, we will be opening for expression of interest, so you will have an opportunity to send your ideas to us, and then we can have technical consultation uh, regarding that. But yeah, all the details will be um, open and clear to you at the end of the month. Okay, then um, I would like to move on to the next speaker, who is Mr. Tapong Tuyanada from Mahido University of Thailand. Um, he is uh, the team leader of our first round awardee for HyperGest. So yeah, I give the floor to Tapong. I see that he's connected. Okay, thank you very much for having me today. And thank you very much as well for this opportunity to join the HyperJS program. So I'm Tadpong Tulianon from Mahido University in Thailand. And this is our first time to have an international collaboration outside Thailand. Okay. So first of all, I would like to introduce to our uh, project with uh, Junosa and Isa, which is the water meal, the future food source for space exploration. 
Okay, for, before uh, moving on, just want to talk a bit about Mahidon University. So we are a research university in Bangkok, Thailand, and I have a few pictures here, which uh, I hope uh, one day some of you can visit Thailand and may visit Mahidon University as well. So we have a lot of um, research faculty, but mostly we focus on um, medical science like um, MD program or uh, everything related to health, but the science program are very good as well. Okay, and about our group, so we are from the Plant Biology and Astro Botany Laboratory in Faculty of Science. Uh, we focus on space related plant research and we would like to find a suitable plan for space usage. And hopefully we can pick some of uh, a very good candidate from our agency or diversity in, in Thailand. Okay, and we, we would love to have the long term plan storage research for space traveling as well. Like uh, how far can we send seed out to space or if we use um, uh, cryo preservation, can we send a plant for a long time space traveling? So that might be a very good uh, question for the future. OK, so next, um, Thailand was invited to join the Artemis program in 2018 through the Artemis Accord. So right now the Thai government is still considering whether we should sign the accord, the contract or not. But at the same time, um, university and uh, private sector start to think about the possibility for us to join uh, the space program with other country. So uh, later in the past five years, we have a lot of research about, about space and space biology. And I have a few pictures from our group, our original group, group that uh, got this opportunity to, to go to ESA to do the research. Okay, and the picture on the right is our highlight, which is water meal, which is the smallest flowering plant on Earth and very fast growing plant as well. So this is uh, our, our model, like organism model to study how plants react under hypergravity environment. Okay, and just want to give you a brief summary. So we want to study the plant adaptation and especially the yield of Asian water meal under hypergravity environment by using ESA large diameter centrifuge, which can provide a long-term gravitational control study. And uh, this program will be funded by UNOSA and ESA and partially by Mahidon University, which we schedule to visit ESA by fall of 2033. Okay, and this is how we observe water meal. So we use um, stereo microscope to do some measurement to study the internal part, internal construction of the water meal. Okay, and picture on the right are water meal in our greenhouse. And we also did some uh, prelim preliminary study about water meal reaction under hypergravity by using a uh, small centrifuge and under, under microgravity by using the clinostat machine, like in the picture. Okay, so before we put the plant inside the gondola of uh, LDC in Aztec, we have to build the water mill chamber first because we want to put the plant inside the gondola for a very long time, about probably 10 to 11 days. Right, but the plant really need light source, so we have to develop. Um, we call water mill chamber to install the water mill flask that contain water mill inside, and then we have to have the proper light source as a uh, for plant to do photosynthesis inside the gondola. So this is our first concept design. So the student just designed by hand, just use a. Uh, simple drawing, and then they build the very first design concept, as you see in the picture, with very simple light source and very simple construction. 
but we know that this design will not work uh, under extreme hypergravity over there. So after that, we decided to collaborate with the synchrotron uh, national lab in Thailand to build the proper uh, chamber. So we we collaborate with them and we have the we call our design number one, which is much stronger and much more reliable. And probably this is the, the first uh, first design that might work in the in the gondola. But there's still some limitation with I will talk about this later. So this is our design diagram. Okay. And lucky us that the Synchrotron Light Research Institute let us send the student over there and work with their engineer and do some actual work in the machine shop to build the prototype of this uh, water mill chamber. This is the design, how it look like. And then they did a uh, test with ANSYS program to do a simulation to see if um, the water mill chamber will survive extreme gravity environment. Okay, this is how the machine shop look like in SLRI. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, the students spent time over there for about a month and a half in order to finish the first prototype, which take much longer time, but uh, at least the student have a very good learning curve and they know now they know how to properly design um, scientific equipment uh, and test under simulation. Okay, this is our first prototype. Okay, now, but let's talk about the limitation for our first one. So first, we found out that our design have a very, very low internal space. So the gondola is very spacious, but our water mill chamber is so tiny. So we, we change it a bit. Uh, we are gonna make it bigger in the next uh, design, which I will show you. And then another thing is that because of the limited space, we can fit only one uh, water mill flask inside uh, the chamber, which is uh, not enough for a lot of analysis after the uh, experiment. Okay, and the flask holder design is very finicky. It, it barely works, uh, to tell you. And another thing is that we have a problem with LED light panel, which is too close to the, the, the flask, which might, um, in worst case, might melt the plastic flask. So we have to change the design with this one. So on the left is our original design. Then we move to the next one, which is design number two. So you see that uh, the chamber is much larger and now we can fit two um, water mill flasks inside with a lot of space by the side of the flask. Okay, and a, a few of basic diagram to show you. Okay, and another thing is that this time we switch from a uh, whole plastic construction, acrylic actually, we switch from acrylic to aluminum on some part to make sure it's stable and reliable enough to put inside the gondola. And this is a basic diagram. Okay, so you see that we stack um, the water mill flask together with LED source on the top and on the bottom. This is what the first prototype looked like. Okay, so you see that instead of all acrylic, now we move on to metal part. Okay, so what's improved? First of all, very much uh, improved in, in space inside. And now we can fit to water mill flask and with metal construction. And now we have a uh, dedicated space for LED driver and control board. But another problem happened. We are not so sure if the LED that we will put in this design will work. So in parallel, we have to test the LED uh, for this plant. So we build a mock-up with uh, acrylic, okay, with the same diameter, um, almost very same diameter with the prototype. Okay, and we install uh, the LED light and control board and everything. And to check first, 
if LED is reliable enough, and secondly, if the plant can survive with this LED. So we, we bring the water meal that we have from the greenhouse, right? Put in the flask, like in the picture, and then install inside uh, our mock-up with LED light, with LED off and on, as the picture you hear, you, you see here. And we test it for a very long time, about two weeks, to see how the plant react, or even if the plant survive. So um, we found out that uh, lucky us, the install uh, the selected LED panel work with water meal, so the plant can grow, uh, can grow just like usual, and sometimes even better than water meal that grow outside in uh, under the sun. I believe because uh, sometimes in the sun, uh, the plant need to face a lot of uh, temperature fluctuation, but in laboratory environment, the plant has very steady temperature and very steady light. <clears throat> That's why plant can grow, uh, the water bee can grow better in uh, under LED light. Okay, and now in summary, we found out that the LED system is reliable, at least for one month for the plant, and then LED yield um, water meal pretty good. Uh, biomass in comparison to uh, the plant that grow under national light. Okay, and then the water mill can grow very well in low light, which is very surprising because this one is outdoor plant. But now we found out that the plant can grow in dim light. This plant might be a good, um, good plant for um, closed system environment or artificial light environment for space application in the future. So what's, what are we going to do at STEC? So this is our experiment design, a brief experiment design over there. So we are going to use the, in total of four water mill chamber uh, per gondola, plus two control chamber, which will fit two water mill flasks per water mill chamber. So in total, we are going to use uh, six gondola. And then we would like to study the water milk growth and survivability for roughly about 10 days, uh, which we have 1G as a control and 20G of hypergravity as a uh, test condition. And after that, we are going to analyze the chlorophyll, carotenoid, protein, and nutrition content. So what hypergest program do or impact to the scientific community in Thailand? Okay. So first of all, the student who joined the program can step outside their comfort zone. We have zero experience in designing the scientific uh, equipment, and we have zero experience in working with uh, best organization like ESA. So student has to work hard and work a lot in order to achieve the goal. And next, we would like to expand the space biology research and awareness to everyone in Thailand uh, through the collaboration of uh, with the top organization in both uh, in Thailand and overseas. And another thing is that after we join Hyperchase program, we might have a research grant opportunity from the government because Thai government really loved for us to have a collaboration in the next with international partnership. So uh, if we have any research program that uh, related with uh, maybe ESA or JAXA, it is much easier for us to, to apply for research grant. Okay, and the last one, the big impact is that uh, because we would like to prepare for space economy through the space ecosystem development for Thailand, if we can join the space program in the future. So what's going to happen after the hyperjets? Um, the next year after we receive hyperjets uh, opportunity, NAA or Thailand National Innovation Agency uh, construct the space economy lifting off. It has been continuing for many years. Okay, why is that? Because they found out that first we start to have international collaboration. Uh, I have a colleague who collaborate with NASA. 
Okay, and we are working with ESA and I have another colleague who work with JAXA. Right now, uh, NAA found out that in Thailand, we have about a thousand space tech ready enterprise, which is very surprising. And next, we found out that the 50%, uh, there is uh, increase in investment uh, of 50% every year for a startup sector. And the last one, the annual growth rate of space business is no less than 10% every year. Okay. So right now, the space economy lifting off kind of uh, ongoing process, and we can see if we would be success in this. OK, but what about the outreach activity in Thailand? So besides research, we did a lot, like a lot of outreach to, to groom the younger generation in Thailand to pay attention about space biology, and we would would want them to know that uh, space is not far away. They are just like uh, maybe what's going on in our neighbor. Okay, and like this, we accept a lot of internship, a lot of visitor from high school or college student to come over and to see what's, what are we doing about the space biology. And in the picture, uh, my student showed show high school students about our water mill chamber, and then they did the hand-on observe of water mill under microscope. Papa, and at the try same to wrap up in two minutes. OK, I'm sorry about that. And at the same time, we have we invited students to come over to play with our plant, the water mill, to see if uh, they are interested. OK, and we, uh, during the World Space Week, uh, last year, our student present the water mill chamber design and a lot of testing uh, to public. And we hope that people in Thailand, we have uh, a lot of awareness about space. OK, and thank you very much for uh, having me here. Thank you very much, Tat Fong, for uh, sharing your development of the project. Oh, this project has been through COVID and uh, we've had some difficulties, but it's really great to see all the things that you've been doing. So, yeah, we wish you luck um, later in the year when you actually have the experiment. Um, I see comments um, for you asking about um, sharing more about water meal. So if there's any links or interesting uh, websites that you can share, maybe you can put it up um, in the chat box later on. Okay. Um, I just want to address one question to Hyperjust. This is more to Jack. Um, I hope Jack is still he here. Sorry. So one of the questions was, are all the experiments performed at the LDC using hypergravity regarding system readiness for space launch? Or are they experiments uh, trying to formulate crystal structures or grain formulation using hypergravity crystals? So can you um, maybe share to us um, what kind of experiments, may maybe how much of the percentage is for space missions and how much is more for uh, purely scientific stuff? Or maybe if you can elaborate on, uh, yeah, uh, and, and answer this question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And most of the experiments are not related to launch research. I mean, there are experiments done to, um, you know, to see the impact of launch uh, on either the structure or the experiment itself, most of the time biology or uh, fluid physics, but uh, most of the experiments are really looking into a science of what the effect of gravity, uh, what the effect gravity has on a particular system. Um, and there could also be crystal systems if, if, if people are interested in that. But uh, if, if you look at the, the manual and one of the slides I showed you with all the colored and the peer reviewed uh, uh, papers, um, you can look in the uh, in the in the studies that have been published making use of the LDC and you also get a flavor of the experiments done. So with this, I'd like to invite to the floor Mr. Uh, Yao Feng Lu from the China Manned Space Agency uh, to give us an overview of the Chinese Space Station Corporation we have. So yeah, um, I see the screen is in full screen. I, I, I think we can hear you. So yeah, please go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, so. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the China Man Space Agency, it was my great pleasure to give you a presentation and to share the latest progress of uh, China's space station. So, my presentation will cover uh, four aspects. 
as you might know, since uh, since the launch of the core module in uh, last uh, in uh, in uh, 2021 April, uh, the first uh, segment of CSS uh, to the Shenzhou 15 manned mission, uh, we have carried out uh, 11 launches and uh, three uh, manned spaceship recoveries, 11 times of uh, EVA and uh, 12 astronauts in four crews continued their work on orbit. Uh, so CMSI completed uh, the assembly and the construction of CSS as uh, scheduled. Uh, the next two slides shows you the various uh, configurations of uh, CSS during its construction. So the final cons uh, configuration looks like the English letter T, so we call it the T-shaped basic config configuration. So this is the first segment, and then we launched the uh, Tianzhou 2 uh, for the first cargo uh, mission, and then launched uh, Shenzhou 12. Uh, it is a manned mission, and with three astronauts uh, stay in the orbit uh, for three months. And after that, we launched uh, Tianzhou 3 for the next uh, uh, cruise uh, cargo, and then uh, Shenzhou 13, uh, and then uh, the first uh, experiment module, Wentian. Um, after that, uh, uh, launched uh, Shenzhou 14 uh, astronaut crew to the station, and the final experiment uh, uh, module, Mengtian, Wentian, sorry, uh, by the end of last year. And now it looks like this. So uh, by now, the three-step development is strategy of human space program, which was made uh, in 1992, has been transferred from concept to reality. The CSS moves to the, moves into the utilization and the development phase. The station. Uh, Design life is at least uh, 10 years and it could be extended service through maintenance. It is equipped with three docking poles to support the visiting spacecraft, like uh, manned cargo spacecraft and other ones, like the Space Survey uh, Telescope, and to support long term stay for astronauts, equipped with two robotic arms, one large and one small, to support astronauts' EVA a module assembly, uh, payload operation, and the cabin, exam uh, cabin outside the uh, examinations. 25 size experimental racks were installed inside and uh, 67 standard payload ports outside. And to support large scale uh, space scientific research and technology verification and space utilization. So the Tianhe core module, uh, Tianhe in Chinese means uh, harmony of the heaven, serves as the management and control center of the CSS with a large robotic arm outside and a node uh, compartment to support rendezvous and docking of other spacecrafts. The node could be also used as an airlock uh, to support EVA. The Wentian experimental module mainly support internal and external tests and experiments. Wentian in Chinese that means ask the sky uh, to serve as a backup uh, control function of the core module. Uh, it is equipped with the airlock module and a small robotic arm to, to, to support astronaut EVA and uh, uh, exposure experiments. The small arms also can be used combined with a big one. The Mengtian experimental module mainly support internal and external tests and experiments. It's also equipped with a cargo airlock to automatically uh, transfer the payload from inside to outside and from outside to inside of the cabin coordinated with astronaut and uh, robotic arms. 
So during the last uh, 30 years, we established a stable cooperation framework with many countries such as Russia, Germany, France, Italy and uh, other countries, as well as the International Space Agency and organizations like USA and ESA in accord accordance with the principle of peaceful use and carried out fruitful cooperation with uh, uh, regard of uh, uh, platform technology and uh, space science and uh, astronaut se selection and uh, training. So we select uh, and uh, send expert to work in WUSA and uh, to support the implementation of uh, uh, manned space technology initiative projects jointly held the uh, UN China International uh, Conference in Beijing and the two sides signed the agreement uh, for the cooperation on utilization of CSS. And we jointly published the announcement of opportunities for the space science experiments projects. Finally, a total of uh, nine projects from 23 entities from 17 countries was selected. And the seven projects have completed the signing of bilateral agreements. And now we are steadily uh, promoting the in, in, in implementation of the projects uh, in CIS. The first uh, project payload has been uploaded with the Tianzhou 6 cargo ship last week. So the CMSA and ESA also established uh, a corporation framework in, 19, uh, in 20, uh, 2014, and a fruitful practical projects was carried out, including the joint uh, national training and also Tiangong-2 gamma ray burst uh, polarization detections, uh, space debris impact tests, and the formulation of interface standards and uh, uh, for the manned space uh, manned space ships. The two sides have jointly uh, selected a space science utilization experimental projects and 10 projects has been approved to carry out uh, utilization ISS and also CSS. A bilateral uh, agency uh, cooperation agreement was signed with Subaku during uh, the Belt and Road Summit in 2019 and resulting in establishment of Joint Committee for the Human Space Cooperation uh, in many fields. We also cooperated with Roscosmos and uh, with follow up uh, cooperation folks. Uh, Focus, fo uh, focused on the collaboration in the CSS and the human space programs of Russia and also the manned lunar uh, exploration. So under the witness of two countries, national presidents, CMSA and RC uh, have signed an interagency cooperation agreement. So at present, the two sides are having in-depth exchange regarding space science and the experiments cooperation projects. We also collaborate with DRI and CNAS with uh, preliminary exchanges in, uh, in many fields, such as uh, space life science and the bio uh, technology. So as a national uh, space laboratory, CSS has uh, uh, 25 scientific experiments racks on board and uh, with uh, actual vacuola payloads docking the position and uh, uh, experimental platforms, as well as the scientific research facility, such as uh, Xuntian Space Telescope. Uh, it can support nearly 1,000 research projects in many fields, such as uh, uh, space life science, human research, uh, microgravity physics, space astronomy, and uh, earth science, and the new space technology and the utilization. At present, China has established a astronaut selection and training system with independent uh, intellectual property rights and the Chinese characteristics. We have established a good team of uh, astronaut faculty and uh, 
with complete facility and equipment for training and mission support, we are happy to provide more opportunities for the uh, foreign astronauts to participate flight missions of uh, CSS. So during the operational stage of CSS, we have uh, we will have uh, two man mission and one to uh, two uh, uh, one or two cargo missions each year, offering certain opportunities for payload uploading and the uh, capacity of uh, active and uh, passive payloads. Or CubeSat releasing uh, f uh, inside and outside of the module. And the re-entry of the manned spaceship will uh, have certain capability to bring back payloads and samples. So more opportunities for the popular science education will be offered in the future. Although we already have uh, are doing uh, a lot of such kinds, kind of things, three times of uh, Tiangong lecture have been conducted uh, to more than 100 million Chinese students in the last two years. Uh, we will use on orbit astronauts and other unique resources of CSS to carry out uh, activities in various forms. So in addition, the human lunar exploration missions will be our focus in the next few years. Uh, and also would like to seek potential opportunities to cooperate uh, with uh, international partners. So China will continue its uh, human space program and take a more open stance to share achievements of China's uh, human space development with uh, countries around the world, especially for the developing countries. We will drive collective efforts around utilization of CSS and amend the lunar explore missions to the peaceful use of uh, outer space and to the benefit of humanity. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Yang Feng. Um, could you elaborate more about the seven projects through the UNUSA CMSA collaboration? Um, you mentioned one is being uh, yeah, uh, launched soon, but can you uh, give us a more bit of detail on the seven projects? OK, so uh, actually it was uh, uploaded uh, last week uh, by the as, uh, May 10, May, May 10, by, by the Tianzhou 6 cargo mission. And uh, it is a project uh, corporate uh, with Tsinghua University and uh, Tokyo University. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, in the next year, we are going to launch two cargo missions, so uh, probably we will see if everything goes smoothly, we will see uh, three or four projects will be uploaded into uh, the, uh, the China. Uh, and uh, some of the project, uh, uh, we don't need to send the hardware to the station. Uh, probably the scientists work together uh, for the researchers. So, uh, I remember probably about four or five projects needs uh, to upload some hardware or samples. Did that answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. It's good to know that one of our projects is definitely going up to the space station soon and we'll see more uh, progress in the coming months. Um, for the second round, I know that uh, CMSA and UNUSA were in discussion. So in the future, uh, we hope to open another round of uh, applications so that you can experiment on the Chinese space station, but it's still in discussion. So um, to all, um, to everyone here, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, uh, yeah, we will definitely keep you updated on our website and social media and everything. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Yao Feng. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'd like to move on to the next speaker, who is Mr. J. Eduardo Mendoza Torres. Um, he is uh, one of the uh, awardees of the Chinese Space Station opportunity that was just explained. So yeah, I will give uh, him the floor. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our project is called Infrared Platform for Ear Observations. It is going to be installed at the China 
Space Station after an UNOSA and China Man Space Agency call. I am Eduardo Mendoza from the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics and Electronics in Mexico. Our previous work in uh, this field uh, begin with uh, the development of a solar portable telescope. But uh, it was uh, focused to observe at mid-infrared wavelengths. And uh, the atmosphere absorbs very, very, very highly these wavelengths. Then the solution to observe at these uh, wavelengths is uh, to go to mountains uh, so that uh, uh, the layer of the atmosphere above us is uh, thinner and of course go to the space. Uh, we have made some observations at uh, mountains and volcanoes in Mexico, but of course we wanted to go to the space. And then we uh, made several designs of uh, telescopes at uh, CubeSats as these examples, and also uh, developed some uh, CubeSats just to acquire practice and to have uh, communication from uh, different distances. And uh, in uh, 2018, uh, we participated in the call made by uh, UNOSA and the China Man Space Agency. Unfortunately, our uh, project was accepted. Uh, our instrument will be in operation six months at the CSS, and the main objectives are to map the water vapor content in the atmosphere of Mexico, of the Mexican territory, and to map the temperature of our territory. Uh, this is with the aim to identify uh, different water vapor contents, particularly low uh, contents in our territory, and also to identify hot spots in the land temperature. This is because in the last years, due to climate change, it has been uh, observed that uh, these hot spots are uh, observed uh, where later on strong storms take place. Well, uh, this has, this, these are some images from the web uh, where we may see uh, how uh, land and clouds are observed at mid-infrared wavelengths. And at the present, we have our qualification model. Uh, this is the payload, uh, what uh, we call the first level, with four cameras, one at visible, two at near-infrared, and one at the uh, mirror infrared. So two at the near and uh, one at the mid infrared. And for thermal control, we have made a passive system, which consists of three levels, which are here depicted. This is our logo and uh, Going to the experience, uh, really, it has been a great, a great experience, acquiring experience in the development of instruments. This is our engineering model. This is the interface, uh, some images of the interface at mid-infrared and at the visible wavelengths. Uh, we have developed uh, telescopes and many different components, mechanical, optical, uh, for CubeSats. And of course, uh, our instrument now uh, has uh, 
in it a lot of, of experience. And also we have made mechanical and thermal simulations and tests, of course, like in this thermovacuum chamber, this is a temperature against time. And after these simulations and some tests, we have uh, became to uh, this design of uh, three quasi concentric cabinets as a passive thermal control. We have also made uh, some tests with meteorological balloons and uh, we have developed uh, radio zone probes, several of them with different weights. This is uh, an image taken at about uh, 20 kilometers. Uh, but also uh, the project uh, led to us to uh, some other possible applications. Of course, astronomy, which was one of the uh, motivations. Here we have images taken with our developed miniaturized telescopes. Uh, for industry, we have uh, some uh, images taken with our cameras. Uh, on, of course, for uh, some astronomy instruments at the loud temperatures, for example, at the high altitude mountains. Uh, and also for medicine, uh, it may be seen, seen here uh, how clear the winds uh, may be identified. And in veterinary also, it may be seen how the eyes, the ears uh, are at higher temperature of this little rabbit. And also for uh, activities with students, with school students. Uh, before uh, to participate in this call, we already had uh, uh, some experience in these activities, but now because we are one of the selected projects, uh, we have more capabilities in uh, reaching the students because they are more interested in uh, these items. Then we use the interest of the students in space science, sciences, in particular in our project, in astronomy. And then we solve exercises uh, with uh, some mathematical tools that uh, usually the students don't understand well, or even then don't like, because in Mexico, the students don't uh, learn well mathematics. They, th there are a lot of problems with uh, this uh, subject. And also we have participated in some uh, astronomy Olympiads. In Mexico, we made this Olympiad, but now with our project, we have more tools uh, to uh, explain to the students. They uh, are more interested for example, with water rockets in uh, handling telescopes uh, and so on. Uh, these workshops also are made at uh, some public uh, sites. As here, this is the contents of an exercise where we solve a very, very uh, short problem, uh, but uh, which is very interesting for the students. And then they even uh, don't notice, but they learn or reinforce some mathematical tools that they don't, don't but that they uh, usually don't want to, to, to know and even hear. Also, we made uh, from time ago uh, a project uh, of uh, measurement uh, of uh, shadows of mast and poles at different sites of Mexico to uh, estimate the ear radius as Aristoteles made in the ancient Greece. So here we have a team of students at Baja California measuring the shadow 
and we have here the uh, measurements uh, of the shadow around the sun culmination. Also, uh, with the students, we have made a small radio telescopes. We explain the details of reception and transmission. They uh, make a small practice uh, and they understand some uh, fundamentals of the work of antennas. But I repeat, this is for school students. Well, these are high school students, uh, but anyhow, this is uh, prior the university. And to finish my presentation, I uh, show here some of uh, the postcards and uh, stickers that we have made in previous years for the Olympiad and uh, for other uh, similar projects, which now uh, are enriched with all the information about our project for the China Space Station. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, may I ask for more details about the project itself? So uh, when is it going to be launched? And uh, can you maybe share us the schedule of the project? Uh, yes, yes. At the present, we have already uh, our qualification model, and in few months, we are going uh, to make the uh, test vibration and thermo vacuum uh, tests of the whole of the whole instrument, uh, and uh, we expect uh, to uh, go to China in November, November this year, uh, where it will be launched. OK, thank you very much. We wish you luck with the project. I'd like to move on to our next program, uh, which is Bartolomeo in collaboration with Airbus Defense and Space. I'd like to invite to the floor uh, Ms. Simone Sass. OK, I see her. And uh, yeah, you can start sharing your screen. Distinguished Excellencies and uh, dear audience, thanks to UNOSA, first of all, to uh, providing me the opportunity to um, guide you through the collaboration which we are having with UNOSA as Airbus Defense and Space. So next slide works like that. So uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding in 2018 with uh, UNOSA in, in the sense of providing access to space by all, for all uh, by the all-in-one space mission service on Bartolomeo. And uh, the second topic which I'm about to cover and reflect on with this presentation is the capacity building exercise in the use of Earth observation satellite data. So um, I will shortly introduce um, the announcement of opportunity which we launched in which UNOSA launched in 2019 for one experiment on the International Space Station where I'm very much look, looking forward to Mr. Ayman Mahmoud from the Egyptian Space Agency providing some more in-depth details on, on the CLIMCAM um, mission which uh, was selected for this mission. And secondly, I would like to give a short over overview on the trainings we, which we provided and the recommended practices which resulted from our collaboration with the UN SPIDER office and uh, which you can also find on the knowledge portal in the internet. So first of all, the call for opportunity with UNOSA um, by providing the opportunity to deploy a mission uh, developed at educational or research institutions from developing countries, which are United Nations member states. Airbus provides uh, support to UNOSA for raising awareness of the role that space science and technology plays in promoting sustainable development and contributes to building capacity in space science and technology. So the um, 
call for opportunity um, was was decided uh, that the mission selection is based on the scientific and technical value of the mission as determined by either the mission's expected contribution to developing human knowledge and capacity to undertake activities in the field of space science and technology or the mission's expected contribution, contribution to enhancing research and development through the technological demonstration of developing and operating the payload and or the mission's expectation, expect, expected contribution to the sustainable development goals um, from the United Nations. So here you see um, the Bartolomeo service is provided using the Bartolomeo platform that has been attached to the European Columbus module on the International Space Station, which you should also see on the image behind me. This picture was taken from SpaceX Crew Dragon during an uh, ISS fly around in November 2021, so it's a little bit outdated already. And you can see that our platform sits at the forefront of the space station facing flight direction, where it is attached to the European um, laboratory Columbus. In this picture, no payloads are attached yet, but you can see clearly, can see clearly the um, gold and blue uh, interfaces which by which the payloads will be attached. The illustration on the left here uh, gives you an impression of the volume available to each payload indicated by the gray, gray boxes. But of course, you're free to define your payload and can fly any shape you like as long as it fits into the available size envelope. So for all further, I, I uh, invite you to listen to Mr. Ayman Mahmoud, and uh, I will now uh, skip to the capacity training on Airbus Defense and Space's extensive imagery solutions. We were offering a capacity building, so training exercises where I thought that this um, image is uh, quite interesting because it's different uh, showing you the resolution of the um, satellite constellations we were building and we are partly operating Part, parts of them are partner satellites like the Kazakhstan Earth Observation Satellite or PAS, the Spanish um, radar satellite. So we are operating the uh, spot mainly for the optical images and Pleiad, followed by Pleiad Neo with a very, very high revisit frequency and a very high resolution. And we are operating together with the German DLR, the Terrasa and the Tandem X constellations. And the uh, final slide from my, my side here is uh, expanding a little bit on the capacity building exercises. So uh, we were providing online and physical trainings um, during uh, regional support offices meetings to institutionals and private entities, which were conducted either by the UN Sp SPIDER or also with the support of UNOSA. And we developed um, recommended practices in collaboration with UNOSA partners, among others, such as uh, the flood hazard assessment with Subarco from Pakistan and the use of digital elevation data for storm surge coastal flood modeling with NATMO from Ghana and the flood maps to enable first aid to land in safe airfield in Nigeria. Of course, there would be a lot of different exercises to be mentioned, uh, which we were um, happy to support UNOSA or the country itself. 
with uh, um, offering, for example, uh, uh, our, our one such uh, one, one Atlas solutions. And uh, I invite you also to have a look at the UN Spider portal where you find those recommended practices in detail explaining ex exactly how to use uh, radar satellite uh, imagery data. So thank you for your attention and um, happy to take your questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Simone, on the details of the different capacity building activities that uh, we are doing together with Airbus, um, especially about the Bartolomeo project. Um, we're hoping that we have uh, future rounds, of course, but what would be your advice to developing nations who want to do something um, using the Bartolomeo platform? Would you have some advice on them on what kind of activities um, Airbus prefers? Or, yeah, is there any kind of information that you'd like to share about uh, yeah, any tips, advice to developing nations that want to work on the uh, Bartolomeo platform? It is a really a great opportunity for uh, developing and emerging space nations to uh, be part of the ISS uh, family because um, it is really an affordable uh, solution on um, uh, conduct an experiment in uh, uh, in space using the ISS capacities so there are no limits in in what field you are interested to um, do your mission or execute your mission or um, experiment on its uh, biological it may be uh, physical chemical you can you can put um, climate change monitoring camera on on board of the international space station but you can also uh, do experiments in um, monitoring the outer space so there are no limits in 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 uh, fields of of uh, yeah scientific experiments so i would invite to approach either me or my colleague uh, per christian steimle i would be happy to share um, contact details to get in some more information on this great opportunity thank you for thank asking thank you very much simone Thank you very much for the information. Yeah, um, the Bartolomeo platform can offer many, many experiment opportunities. So yeah, if you're interested, of course, you can wait for the next round uh, between UNICEF and Airbus, but of course, uh, please feel free to reach out to Airbus as well. So now Thank I'd you. like to invite to the floor, Mr. Ayman Mahmoud, um, who is from the Egyptian Space Agency, who is the team leader of the first round awardee, the ClimCam team uh, for the Bartolomeo platform project. Okay. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Ayman Ahmed and I'm from the Egyptian Space Agency. I'm here today to uh, speak about our, uh, our project ClinCam. Um, our project is uh, awarded by United Nations uh, and uh, Airbus. Uh, uh, the Space Agency in Egypt have been uh, established around four years ago, so it's uh, almost a um, new space agency. Uh, we are uh, targeting to foster the development of space science and technology in Egypt. Uh, we would like also to acquire the capability to build satellites, capacity building, and also to use space service and application in developing um, our country. So uh, our CRIMCAM uh, project have a specific objective, uh, which is addressing mainly the sustainable, sustainable development goals of Egypt and the United Nations, and also ultimately in the African uh, agenda. So our uh, project is aiming to develop a camera. Uh, this camera will be installed on board the Bartolomeo module of the International Space Station. Uh, uh, this camera should take uh, images for the eastern part of Africa, as you can see uh, in the map here. Also, we would like to demonstrate that uh, African engineers would be able collaboratively to develop uh, high-tech space product that can have technology readiness level uh, up to nine. So uh, flying uh, a product from Africa on board the International Space Station would, very, would be very um, um, great and would uh, add a lot of value and confidence to our engineers and youth and the students. 
the technology demonstration is uh, a very uh, important uh, objective of the project so that we can uh, build this uh, camera uh, in Africa. Uh, the camera will be built by Egypt, Kenya and Uganda. Uh, the rationale of the project is to address some specific objectives uh, and sustainable, sustainable development goals of, uh, of Africa. Of course, you may know that uh, Africa suffers a lot from the effect of climate change. And this effect of climate change um, increases the, the hang, hunger, and reduce the uh, agricultural area. Uh, so we, we, we address here sustainable development goals related to uh, zero hunger, quality of education. Uh, of course, we involve with us a lot of researchers and students from the three uh, African countries, uh, Egypt, Kenya and Uganda. Uh, since our product will be manufactured and assembled and tested in Africa, so we are targeting to uh, uh, level up our industry uh, level and innovation and infrastructure in the three countries. Uh, also, we are addressing the uh, climate change uh, effect in Egypt and Kenya and Uganda as part of East uh, African region. Uh, we have also a sustainable uh, relationship with, Egypt, with Kenya and Uganda as a partnership between the uh, three uh, countries. So uh, in this project also we are addressing the uh, objective of African space policy and African space strategy which have been announced by the African Union Commission around five years ago uh, which targets the uh, development of knowledge and sharing uh, uh, capacity inside Africa and uh, intra-Africa continent collaboration between different uh, countries. Um, we have been awarded the project uh, during the IAAC uh, 2021 uh, in United Arab Emirates and during this uh, uh, event we have uh, received the uh, announcement of, of, of uh, the award to be uh, as a start point of our collaboration. Now, as we are making the uh, capacity building through our collaboration be between the three countries, Egypt, Kenya and Uganda, uh, this is, as you can see here uh, in the le left, uh, in the right hand side picture, this is our te team uh, uh, for, for the project. It composes teams from Egypt, uh, also uh, um, engineers from Kenya and the engineers from Uganda. This uh, uh, photo is taken only uh, three months, uh, two months ago, and uh, the in the um, uh, front of the entrance of the Egyptian Space Agency. On the right, of the left hand side, you can see um, the first prototype of our camera, which includes the mechanical, the optics, and the electronic boards. Uh, and these um, boards are individually uh, being developed and collaboratively being uh, uh, designed by the different uh, members of our team from the three different countries. Uh, as, as I was saying that we have also addressing the uh, African agenda. This means that we are collaboratively uh, co uh, developing these modules and this fosters the knowledge sharing and experience between the African engineers. Here, as you can see, uh, we, we have uh, started some uh, uh, meetings between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the engineers from Egypt, Kenya and Uganda. Here, uh, the image from, uh, from uh, two months uh, in the headquarter of the Egyptian Space Agency. And uh, this was the, during the design and simulation of the uh, modules, different modules of the camera. Uh, now we have uh, been develop, developing the mechanical board uh, and also we are now working on the machine learning module which will be used on board the camera to make uh, an estimation of the vegetation index which is a very crucial uh, uh, point of our project to identify and to see how the climate change will affect the vegetation area and the agricultural area in the eastern part of Africa. Also, uh, we, we have made some uh, thermal vacuum testing to our different modules of the camera so that as you can see in the, in the picture we can verify the performance uh, of the electronics and the effect of the thermal change for the mechanical board which is reflecting also the performance of the optical boards uh, movement and shift due, due to a thermal environment uh, in the space. Uh, we are now uh, have uh, been uh, developing the uh, mechanical model for the camera and this model now uh, 
waiting the next step uh, is to uh, uh, make the fixation as a fit check for the uh, Argos module, uh, which is part of the Bartolomeo platform. And this one uh, will be uh, one of our most uh, important steps in the project to ensure that our final model, this one of course is not the final model, this is only the uh, mechanical model which you are using to verify that the requirement we, which we have received from uh, Airbus will be translated into a proper design that can mechanically fit uh, on board the Argos module uh, Bortromio. Uh, here, uh, my final slide, which uh, provides some dissemination of our activities, which is related to the training and capacity building uh, for space technology and hands-on session for uh, African countries. We are uh, providing this training for uh, a lot of African nations in, in, in Africa, and this training uh, provides a hands-on training, which can also foster and uh, prove that we have a sustainable uh, and long-term partnership with uh, our uh, countries, especially Kenya and Uganda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayman, for the presentation on the ClimCam project team. It's really great to see the developments and yeah, it's a very exciting project. So one question to you is how did um, this team form? So it's from three different countries. How did this partnership uh, begin and uh, what are the benefits of working together with um, your neighboring countries? Yes, um, uh, we have this partnership started in uh, 2019. Uh, by the kickoff uh, and activation of the Egyptian Space Agency, as we have been mandated to strengthen our collaboration with the African countries. So we started an initiative which is called the African Development Satellite. And this African Devel Development Satellite is a multilateral uh, intercontinental uh, project in Africa, which aims to uh, collaboratively build a uh, nano satellite. Uh, this project involves a lot of countries, among them Kenya and Uganda. When we have uh, been uh, uh, announced by the uh, UNOSA website that there is a call related to the Bartolomeo payload module, uh, we have uh, formulated a team between uh, Egypt, Kenya and Uganda so that, as you can see, both uh, of these countries or three countries, Egypt, Kenya and Uganda, are located in the eastern part uh, of Africa. And this, of course, will imply that we have uh, a very common interest, uh, as you can see in the photo here, we have a very common interest, Egypt, Kenya and Uganda together, very common interest due to our needs, so that one application uh, or one uh, module can serve the uh, specific part of Africa. We have also for, for formulated the team which involved uh, electrical engineers from the three countries, optical, mechanical, uh, thermal, as well as the software engineers and we have started recently uh, nine months of uh, collaborative work between the uh, three agencies here in the Egyptian Space Agency to produce the engineering model by the end of this year, hopefully. Thank you very much for the input and it's it's really great that um, this partnership is with your neighboring uh, countries that have the same uh, topic and needs. So I think this is a great um, great sample of collaboration that other teams can take into consideration when they apply for yeah access yeah. to space for initiative programs thank you very much Ayman. so with this um i'd like to move on to a general q a sessions where um general session where i can pick up all the different uh questions that have been uh asked so uh, one of the questions I wanted to elaborate um, and uh, maybe address to Zarm, um, there was one question about a suggested simple experiments in the drop, uh, in the drop tower um, about microgravity. So uh, what are good simple experiment examples that uh, use the microgravity environment that would lead up to uh, a satellite development? Uh, uh, that would be a good example for uh, yeah, satellite development. So as we explained, there's a gradual learning path and how can microgravity and experiments at the drop tower be useful for satellite development? Um, maybe Merle or uh, uh, Thorben? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, uh, right now I can't uh, give you any um, yeah, simple example for, um, for a new, new experiment. Of course, you have to 
come up with uh, with your own idea, but uh, I can uh, recommend to um, to have a look um, at the um, uh, former participants um, um, for drop tests and also um, um, have a look at our website uh, where you can find some uh, examples for um, experiments um, yeah, performing um, yeah, science and their research um, in microgravity at the drop tower. Okay, thank you very much. I also saw a question um, in the chat um, about Bartolomeo. So our UN uh, opportunities, so the Access to Space for All Initiative opportunities are open to all UN member states. Um, of course, in some projects, we uh, limit that to uh, developing nations or economies in transition, but for Bartolomeo, it was open to all. Maybe, Simone, if you want to elaborate on our Bartolomeo project. Yes, exactly. I wanted to ask Andy again if I understood his, uh, the question uh, rightly, because uh, of course, uh, Bartolomeo is accessible to every nation which uh, would be allowed to, to operate an experiment or a mission on the International Space Station, meaning that uh, every UN uh, member nation is, is in, uh, hardly invited to to, to get into contact with Airbus, who is operating Bartolomeo. And with the UNOSA, it has been indeed a one-time exercise with the announcement of opportunity. And as uh, uh, Hasuki already mentioned, that we are currently evaluating if we can we can uh, probably have another or a new um, announcement of opportunity coming out of the memorandum of understanding the collaboration with UNOSA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone. So yes, for Airbus, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we really uh, hope to be able to open a new opportunity again in the future. So where do we go from here? Um, maybe that's a good question. So uh, I know some of the awardees uh, mentioned what they're doing now, but if um, they have, let's say, a future vision on what they want to do after they're done with their experiment, um, maybe it might be interesting. So uh, let's see, um, maybe Eduardo. So for the Chinese space station, um, after you have your uh, payload up there. Do you have any future plans on what you want to do after that? So maybe you want to go for a bigger payload or um, yeah, maybe if you have some visions, please share with us. Uh, yes, yes. This is a good question because in uh, the design, in the design of uh, our instrument for the China Space Station, we have considered the uh, inner uh, cabinet i mean the smallest case where we have our payload uh, to fill uh, the two u specifications i mean it will be like a cubesat of uh, uh, 10 by 10 by 20 centimeters uh, and then for uh, the next step we uh, are going uh, to do a CubeSat. And of course, we are looking for different calls in order to put it uh, on the space. But uh, all uh, the subsystems are now able uh, to fit uh, this, this size. So um, certainly it is uh, a good chance uh, even to go further with our projects. Thank you very much. May I ask the same question to Liliana? So uh, currently you're developing the experiment for a drop test, but in the future when you're done with uh, the experiment at the Bremen drop tower, um, what are your future steps? Um, what do you want to do further with the experience and knowledge you've gained um, with drop tests? <laughs> okay. Uh, we hopefully, um, like to to create a new research topic in our research group in the mechanical engineering, and we pretend to involve more students to, to the to the other programs in our experiment. And now, I the 
our students are looking for um, for, for graduate programs and I hopefully they are considered um, space topics in her in her graduate study. Yeah, um, last but not least, Ayman, I know um, the CLIMCAM team is already trying to put up a payload, but what are your future steps as um, as the CLIMCAM team, but also as the Egyptian Space Agency? Um, maybe there's two different answers there, but what are your future plans after uh, the project is going up? Um, we think that uh, if we will be able to successfully uh, put this camera and work very well, uh, with our uh, machine learning model. Uh, we will extend, of course, our collaboration with um, other African countries to make use of this camera as a prototype and as a pilot project of uh, intercontinental collaboration between the different African countries. Uh, this pilot project, I think, will facilitate a lot of issues that can occur during the joint development, not only in the technical issues, but only in the administrative issues related to this collaboration. So I think having this pilot project as a successful one, it can also provide our future collaboration with African countries, as well as the local uh, industrial uh, uh, confidence we will, our engineer will gain uh, from this project. So we can use it uh, with a larger scale in our future satellites, also with uh, our, uh, our African development satellite phase two, which can involve a lot of African countries uh, this uh, demo will be uh, used for um, future successful models like this. Thank you. Um, I see one question about uh, future commercial platforms um, besides the International Space Station. So at UNUSA, we are always interested in uh, partnering with these uh, new uh, commercial space stations if they have uh, the capacity to uh, provide experiment opportunities, uh, let's say CubeSat deployment opportunities and also, yeah, um, that was one of the things I've mentioned um, in the list of what we're looking for in partnerships. So yes, um, if there's anything, please uh, let us know um, because we're always interested for new partnerships. Another question I see is, uh, is there uh, any discussion uh, forum platform where people from member countries can contact each other? Um, at the moment, we have different workshops. Maybe my colleagues can uh, share in the chat. We have a workshop called the UNIAF workshop, uh, which is open for applications right now, where we will really be talking about capacity building, not only about the Access to Space Bar initiative, but about the different uh, success stories, um, challenges, and how to reach out to the right people. So we'll be really focusing on capacity building. So uh, we think that could be a platform for discussion. But of course, um, we appreciate this comment and the idea. Uh, we hope to, uh, of course, bring all the feedback and comments we received through the expert meeting back and to discuss with our partners and all. So, so yeah, we, we do hope that uh, we can as I said, and one of the objectives of the expert meeting is to really uh, bring together people, uh, build networks and uh, uh, build new partnerships. So thank you for the comment. We will definitely uh, yeah, consider this. And um, yeah, I see my colleagues have put in uh, the links. Uh, we also have UNIF, but we also have, if you're interested in, let's say, climate change, we also have a different event, a UN Austria Symposium um, that is going on as well. So um, at UNUSA, we have a lot of different activities. I think they're all, they are all great platforms for you to meet and engage and make uh, partnerships. But yeah, we, we appreciate this comment and we'll definitely uh, talk about it within. OK, then, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you all to the partners and the awardees for presenting. Have a nice thank day, you. everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.